Great, thank you for that introduction. We're going to talk about new drugs for HIV. What's on the horizon? I have no disclosures. There are now 34 drugs approved for the treatment of HIV, stretching back 35 years to the very first AZT in 1987, all the way to last year, 2021, when cabotegravir, the first long-acting injectable antiretroviral, was approved. In addition, there are a number of agents in the pipeline. These are in existing classes, such as the nucleosides, the non-nukes, the protease inhibitors, the entry inhibitors, and the integrase inhibitors. And there are candidate compounds with new mechanisms of action, including the capsid inhibitors, the maturation inhibitors, and broadly neutralizing antibodies. What I'd like to do with this talk is to focus on three of these drugs and one of these classes that may well push the strategy of long-acting therapies for HIV. So let's jump right in. Is Latrovir? is an investigational nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor that inhibits reverse transcriptase by preventing translocation. It has a long half-life of 50 to 60 hours in plasma and is quite potent in vitro with broad coverage against HIV-1 and 2 and multidrug resistant strains. It has both low-dose and parenteral formulations. The phase 1b study showed that a single oral dose of Islatrovir produced significant virologic activity through 10 days after administration. And a phase 2b study combined Islatrovir with the non-nucleoside deravirine and 3TC, and this had, was dosed once daily and had favorable virologic outcomes to a standard comparative regimen of two nukes and deravirine. This launched a series of studies with Islatrovir, treatment studies giving Islatrovir daily or in a novel strategy, weekly oral therapy. There was a monthly oral administration of Islatrovir for prevention, long-acting injectable was being designed, and yearly implants of Islatrovir that we're now reaching clinical development. A phase 2b switch study in people who were suppressed studied an interesting two-drug combination of Islatrovir and Deravirine compared with a three-drug Bictegravir-based regimen. This study was stopped early because of dose-related lymphopenia with CD4 cell decreases that was associated with Islatrovir use. Consequently, the US FDA put Islatrovir on clinical hold. What I can tell you today is that the mechanism of this lymphopenia is being investigated, and what's known so far is that it is strictly applicable to the lymph lymphocyte uh, cell line, not to other cell lines, and it does not appear to be a mitochondrial toxicity. So lots of investigations into this mechanism of action. MK8507 is an investigational non-nucleoside that's potent against HIV in vitro and is active against common non-nucleoside resistant variants. This compound too has a long half-life and that supports once weekly oral dosing. Its resistance profile is similar to deravirine and has a low incidence of central nervous system side effects in early studies. A phase one study showed potent antiviral activity, and this supported a phase two study of MK8507 at the three doses you see there, in combination with oral Islatrovir, the compound I just reviewed. And these were given together with weekly dosing, so an oral weekly regimen. Again, dose-dependent lymphopenia was seen on this study, and you see from the design that it was MK8507 that was at three different doses. So there is a contribution of MK8507 to 
the lymphopenia caused by his latrovir. That led to pause in development of this compound, again, as the mechanism of action of lymphopenia is further explored. Chloe Orkin reviewed cabotegravir, and of course that is an approved agent. And it was approved on the basis of phase three studies, references are here, which were both dosed monthly of cabotegravir with rolpivirine. That was approved by the EMA and the FDA, and specifically in the US, this was for once monthly dosing. As we've heard, there have been innovations already in cabotegravir. The first of which, as reviewed by Chloe, was the Atlas 2M study published by Turner Overton in Lancet, which showed that an every other month dosing, a Q8 week dosing, was non-inferior to monthly dosing. And that led to its approval both in Europe and now the US FDA has also approved every other month dosing. Also as mentioned by Chloe, the lead in with an oral formulation of cabotegravir and rolpivirine was also examined retrospectively in her study. And uh, the favorable results of the lead-in led to both the European and FDA regulatory agencies to allow for optional lead-in dosing. There are additional um, innovations of cabotegravir that are in progress. As you know, it's currently only recommended for people who are suppressed. The AIDS Clinical Trials Group in the US is exploring enrolling people with suboptimal adherence in study 5359, and enrollment continues. Also, there was a poster at this meeting on Monday which looked at a more concentra concentrated formulation of cabotegravir, which would lead to a lower volume of injections. And that same poster described subcutaneous dosing of cabotegravir, which many would favor. Also, there is further development of cabotegravir. There's a cabotegravir prodrug, which is injectable, extended release, and nano-formulated. And these are animal data in mice and rats. The cabotegravir prodrug dosed at time zero, and you can see the concentrations in red in both animals, and the Concentration extends and exceeds target concentrations through a year of follow-up. And that compares favorably with standard cabotegravir shown in green. So could this lead to yearly dosing of a cabotegravir prodrug? Also, novel ways of administering antiretrovirals are under investigation. And cabotegravir is one example that's been tried in a micro-needle patch which looks a little prickly here on the left, but actually those micro needles do not reach the nerve. So these are painless patches, which could be used to administer antiretroviral agents. In a modeling experiment, you can see at the highest patch doses used that concentrations exceeded target levels of cabotegravir for 28 days. So might we have patch formulations of antiretrovirals in the future? Turning to new mechanisms of action, you'll recall in the HIV life cycle that after HIV enters the target cell, it needs to disassemble its capsid to release the RNA and viral enzymes and allow the viral life cycle to proceed. And then when viral assembly occurs, the capsid reassembles, and this is a step necessary for full maturation and infectiousness of the viral particle. The new capsid inhibitor class inhibit both the step of disassembly and the step of assembly of the capsids. The candidate compound is lenacapavir, potent in the test tube, and once again has a long half-life and is available in both oral and subcutaneous formulations. Phase one sub-Q doses were tested and that led to a phase two study in treatment naive individuals using lenacapavir at a subcutaneous dose of every six months in combination with two nucleosides and then novel two-drug regimens. And that performed favorably to a standard three-drug regimen. And then recently published was the use of lenacapavir in heavily treatment-experienced patients where over a short two weeks, oral lenacapavir showed a significant virologic activity in these heavily treatment-experienced patients. 
Then they were allowed to optimize their background regimen and add lenacapavir subcutaneous for six months, and that led to resuppression of virus in the majority of patients. FDA put a clinical hold on this compound due to a vial issue, which was lifted in May of this year, and an NDA was submitted for treatment experience patients in June of 21, which was not approved, but this was recently refiled and accepted by the FDA, so we may hear about approval of this compound soon. In parallel, the EMA submission was in August of 2021, and we just learned last month that there was a positive opinion by the regulatory committee. Lastly, broadly neutralizing antibodies. They bind to one or more sites on the HIV envelope glycoprotein trimer, as shown in this diagram. So some bind to the CD4 binding site, the V1, V2 loop, the V3 stem, or the membrane protein external region, the MPER. To summarize a lot of data, more than 17 BNABs have been evaluated for safety and pharmacokinetics in humans and generally showed them to be safe and have antiretroviral activity. They also, as has been the subject at this conference, appear to have a vaccinal effect where they are enhancing host immunity and CD8 and NK cell responses. Additional strategies have been, moved, have been used to optimize BNABs, including improving their potency, breadth, and serum half-life and delivery. And we're now seeing potent, broad, and multi-specific antibodies, which could be dosed less frequently, every two to six months, and exploration of subcutaneous dosing. Combination strategies are in progress, phase one and two studies, with two, three, and four BNAB combinations. And in parallel, broadly neutralizing antibodies are com being combined with long-acting antiretrovirals. ACTG 5357 combines an extended formulation of VRC07 with long-acting cabotegravir. And another study looks at 3BNC117, the monoclonal antibody, in combination with the fusion inhibitor, albuvertide. What I've tried to do for you in this brief time is to give you an overview of where we may go next with long-acting therapies for HIV. I'd like to acknowledge our supporters and people who helped with the talk, including colleagues from academia, industry, and the community. Thank you.